Good morning, my students. Good morning. Good morning, please. Now, come to this online classroom. Uh, we are going to have a lecture this morning, okay? So, the, all my students, please come to this online classroom. We are going to start the lecture for today in a very few seconds, all right? Okay, so now please allow me to proceed to my desk in order to deliver my lecture at the moment, okay? So see you in a few seconds. Hello, good morning, all my, all my students, good morning, okay? So the, the lecture this morning as I have informed you before, okay, will uh, be uh, founded upon legal doctrines, not in Thai law, but in English law. Remember, we have already taken a lessons, okay? We have taken indeed a few lessons on uh, the doctrines in Thai law uh, regarding how to protect the will or intentions of the parties in order to make sure that intentions of the party will be free and will be genuine. Remember, we have explored at great, great length the deep uh, principles of Thai law regarding uh, regarding what regarding the fraud uh, and uh, mistake and also jurors. Okay, so today we are not going to look at Thai laws. We have seen Thai law. Okay, and uh, for the purpose of comparison, we are going to look at English laws. Okay, so. Well, in the UK, uh, normally students will check the whole year, okay, they're checking the contract law, but uh, in this country, okay, the, we are going to focus, we don't normally focus on Thai law, but uh, for the sake of completion, I feel that uh, I'm going to also to give you a, a brief account of English law as well, okay, the, in order to, the, in order for you to gain, you know, some insights into uh, what happens or the, what's going on in the English law. Uh, Thai laws uh, may perhaps have some things, okay? Uh, Thai laws may have in some uh, aspects in which okay, we uh, see that uh, there are some, the, you know, the weaknesses, okay, or the deficiencies, so that our exploration or journey into English law will perhaps provide some insights into, uh, you know, useful ways, uh, to uh, in which we can just you know make amendment to Thai law in order to arrive at you know that some the uh, sort of uh, some perfect steps. Okay, so now I should say that uh, even though we have some principles of Thai law, our principles may not be perfect. Okay, so that if we look at you know the English laws or the law of other countries, we will have sort of comparative insights into the way in which okay we may. Uh, make amendment to the Thai law, okay, in order to arrive at something much better than what it is now, okay, so, uh, well, the, among too many doctrines which are available in English contract law, uh, we simply will not have, you know, enough time, okay, it's probably all doctrines, so I think that we are going to select, okay, some the doctrines of particular importance uh, for the purpose of our teaching this morning, okay. So, what will be selected, okay, for the purpose of, of our uh, teaching this, this morning, okay? So, we will perhaps look at, you know, the doctrine of misrepresentation, okay? The doctrine of misrepresentation, okay? The, uh, you may feel that this is something similar to the doctrine of fraud in the Thai law, but uh, I uh, will uh, bring you, you know, I, I will bring to, to your attention that the English doctrine of misrepresentation, it is something much broader than uh, the principle of law of fraud, okay, as contained in our civil and commercial code, okay, and we will also look at the English doctrine of jurors, okay, or, of course, I means something similar to the principle of jurors in Thai law, but again, we will see uh, in due course that the English doctrine of jurors is uh, broader than the position in Thai law, okay, that in some situations, okay, that as we have seen, Thai law does not provide remedies, okay, the, to the, the parties who may be injured by the I mean, by jurors, okay. As we can remember, okay, some situations, some threats 
in Thai law may not be regarded as jurist, okay, so that the party who uh, might be affected by you know, the, the its declaration, okay, which is made under jurist, may not have remedy in Thai law, but if, if I mean, the, the facts, okay, of the same kind occur in the, in, in, in the, this country, and let's suppose that English law applies to that situation, then the, we will see that English law provides remedies for the parties concerned, okay? And we will also explore the doctrine of undue influence. If you look at this doctrine, okay, undue influence, this is not uh, known in the Thai law. We don't have the doctrine of, uh, in this country, in the Thailand civil and commercial code, we similarly do not have the doctrine of undue influence as what we will see in English law. And of course, if time permits, okay, I'm not quite sure whether time uh, will uh, permit us to discuss, okay, to, uh, the doctrine of mistake uh, in English law as well. If time permits, then we will uh, also, you know, have some discussion, okay, of the doctrine of mistake in English law, right? So now let me begin with the first doctrine, okay, the doctrine of misrepresentation, okay. So the what is it? We will begin with this question. Okay, what is it when we talk about a misrepresentation? Okay, what is it? Okay, as the word suggests, okay, it is the act of representing, representing something which is false. Miss means what? Miss means not true or false. So misrepresentation. It is the act of representing something or some facts. Okay, some fact of falsity. Okay, and uh, then uh, this. False statement or this falsity is uh, told, okay, or it is expressed to the other party. Let's say that we have again A and B. A just gives B a false statement in order to induce B, okay, to enter into a contract with A. Okay, in this case, we can see that a contract is formed, okay, as a as a result of what? As a as a result of a misrepresentation by A. Let's say that A wants to sell the painting to B. The painting is not the painting it is it is not by any you know the famous artist but A wants to sell the painting to B at a higher price so that A tells a lie to B that this painting uh, has been by a very famous artist. So B relies on the statement made by A. Okay and uh, B B therefore Okay, in, in alliance on that false statement given by A, B just enters into the contract with A. So, so in this case, a contract is made, okay, is made by what? By misrepresentation, okay. The, it is something, you may see that it is something similar to fraud in this country, but we, we will see very, very shortly that, you know, the English, the English doctrine of misrepresentation, it is something much broader than what we have in Thai law, okay, so the, uh, the fraud, okay, fraudulent, fraudulent misrepresentation, it is just one type of misrepresentations, okay, there are in fact three types of misrepresentations in English law, okay, so the, we will see that uh, shortly, okay, so the, what is going to be consequences of a misrepresentation if A does, you know, the tells B, I mean, some the untrue statement okay in order to induce B to enter into a contract with A and B does enters into a contract with A in reliance on such false statement. The consequence is just that that contract will just be voidable. Okay, so the legal consequence is whatever let's say not voidness. Okay, the contract is not void but the contract is voidable. When it is voidable that means that the party who is uh, injured by you know that that contract which has been made by misrepresentation misrep can just rest in the contract. So the very first remedy is okay. The very first remedy is to rest in the contract. Okay, rescission. Okay, this is one of the remedies. <clears throat> now, in addition to rescission of uh, the contract which is procured by misrepresentation, okay, the party who is injured me on sale claim damages okay for loss which is you know the which is I mean suffered as a result of such misrepresentation okay so uh, again when this picture just explained to you okay the 
nature of a misrepresentation. Okay. A does gives B a false statement in order to induce B to enter into a contract with A and B relies on such misrepresentation to, you know, given by A. So a contract is in a way made as, as a result of the misrepresentation given by A to B. So in this case, B can do what? B can claim that a contract, okay, a contract is not going to be valid. This contract is therefore voidable and B may just again, okay, exercise uh, resort to this remedies, okay, first, recession and uh, secondly, claiming damages for loss sustained by B, okay, as a result of such uh, contract, okay. So, the, as I have brought to your attention, okay, in English law, uh, the doctrine of misrepresentation, it is, it is much broader than the principle of law of fraud in the, you know, our uh, civil and Commercial Code of the Thailand. Okay, so uh, if you look at the types of misrepresentations in English law, there are three types. The first one is called fraudulent, fraudulent misrepresentation. Okay, as the name suggests. Okay, it is the misrepresentation which is which is okay which is made by fraud. Okay, so this is something you know comparable to fraud as uh, you know, that as uh, mentioned in our civil and commercial code, okay? And the other two types are this, okay? The negligent misrepresentation, okay? This is, this is, uh, this is a misrepresentation which is made not with the intention to deceive. It is not with any fraudulent, you know, intent, but it is made through negligence, okay? We will see that very, very shortly, okay? And the last type of misrepresentation, it is called the innocent, okay? The innocent misrepresentation, okay? The, so that it is a misrepresentation which is made without fraud, without any intention to deceive, and without any negligence on the part of the misrepresenter, okay? But it is made honestly or innocently, okay? The, uh, so the person, let's say A, A tells something to B uh, that is false, but A does not have any intention to deceive B. A simply does not know that it is untrue, okay? A believes that it is correct, but in fact the statement is not correct, it is false, okay? And A is in a way not negligent, okay? So in this case, A does make the innocent misrepresentation, okay, so you may feel that, well, you know, when A does mean tells B something, something false without any, without any deceitful intention, okay, and without negligence, and B does enters into a contract with A, okay, on account of the misrepresentation by A, okay, why can a contract, you know, become avoidable? Simply because, you know, that because A is just innocent. A is just honest. But the thing is, the thing is that in the English law, okay, so the law makes sure that, you know, that the contract is made due to, the contract is made as, as, as a result of what? As a result of free will and genuine uh, will by the party, okay, so that even though in this case A gives B a statement which is false without any deceitful intention, okay, with no negligence, but the thing is that B enters into a contract with A as a result of such misrepresentation by A, so that, you know, a contract should not be allowed to stand, okay, if B elects to just, you know, the set aside a contract, okay, so it's up to B in this case whether B will set aside a contract or not, okay, so the law also protects B even though A is honest, A just tells something, uh, A just tells B something which is false, without any, you know, intention to receive B, and without negligence, in this case, a contract can also be voidable, okay? So, this diagram, okay, this picture, to mean to give you, uh, you know, a summary of three types of misrepresentation in English law. The first one is 
fraudulent misrepresentation, okay, and the second one is what? The second one is negligent misrepresentation, and the third one is innocent misrepresentation, okay, so uh, this is something which you should bear in mind, okay, because this picture will just uh, remind you that, okay, the, the English law, the English uh, the English doctrine of misrepresentation, it is of, you know, it is of a broader application than what we have uh, in the Thai law, okay, under the umbrella of the principle of fraud in the uh, civil and common code of Thailand, okay, so now let's begin, be, let's we begin with, okay, the first type of misrepresentation, which is, suppose, fraudulent misrepresentation, okay, so in this case, as the name suggests, fraudulent, fraudulent misrepresentation. Okay, that means that that means that it is the misrepresentation by fraud, i.e., by uh, some intention. Okay, or uh, in any or by intent to deceive the other party. A and B make a contract. Okay, A does mean gives uh, some facts which becomes false to B, and uh, B relies on. The statements made by A and therefore B enters into a contract with A. In this case, right, uh, A will have to be liable to B uh, because A just causes B some injury, okay? In fact, when we talk about, you know, fraudulent misrepresentation, the, the li liability of the person who makes this kind of misrepresentation, it is, in fact, you know, liability in tort. In in the England, okay, the English law has the the, the rule the you know the rule of tort, okay, the tort. There are in fact two types of torts in the English law, torts which are committed, you know, the intentionally. We call this one intentional torts, and the tort of negligence. That means that I mean that this is the tort of negligence. It is a tort which is which is committed not intentionally, but through negligence, okay, so uh, back to the tort of deceit. A tort of deceit, it is one type of, you know, intentional torts. Okay, there are, in fact, many categories of intentional torts, okay. One category, it is the tort of deceit. Okay, how is this tort committed? This tort is committed by doing what? By, you know, the, by making making a false statement or a false representation, okay, or we can use the word misrepresentation, okay. A, in a way, just tells me something, something false, okay. That, uh, so if A wants to deceive B, A has a, had the intent to deceive B in this case. If B, okay, that suffers some injury due to the statement given by A, which in with an intention to deceive B like this, A commits, you know, a tort of deceit, and uh, then A will have to be liable uh, to B for any loss suffered by B as a result of, you know, the false statement given by A. Okay, so in a way, you mean the act of giving, you know, giving a misstatement to another person, okay, and, uh, you know, when another person relies on that statement, and suffer some loss, the person who makes the statement, or we can call this person the misrepresenter, the misrepresenter will have to be liable for the misrepresentee, okay, so for any loss suffered by the misrepresentee, okay, so uh, under the umbrella of the tort of deceit. So in a way, you know, the liability, the liability flowing from the act of, you know, the making a misrepresentation it is in fact you know li li liability in what in tort under the um, under the, the umbrella of a tort of deceit but you know this rule of tort of deceit okay can also be linked with or can also be transported into a contractual context as well Okay, the, in, in, in the, the way like this, okay? Let's say that we have again A. If A, okay, fraudulently, i.e. mean the deceitfully, or with the intention to deceive, okay? If A makes a statement, 
or may I say misrepresentation to B, okay, in order to induce B to enter into a contract with A, okay. In this case, if B relies on such misstatements given by A and concludes a contract with A, right, and later B suffers some loss or some injury as a result of the conclusion of the contract, okay, that based upon such misrepresentation, in that case, okay, the A will have to be liable to B, okay, the contract between A and B should be voidable. Okay, so this is the application of the rule of tort of deceit to the context involving contracts. Okay, if A and B, okay, they, they are going to make a contract and A just gives a statement to B which is false and that statement is given to B in order to induce B okay, to enter into the contract and when A has an intention to Deceit B, A knows that you know the statement given, the statement to be given to B is false. A with such knowledge, okay, gave the statement to B in order to induce B to enter into a contract with A. In that case, okay, that it is of course a tort of deceit. Uh, in addition to the tort of deceit, uh, A will also be liable to be in contract. The contract in this case will become void. Okay, so put simply the application of the, the you know the rule of tort of receipt to a contract, it can it can also happen in a context where where A gave the statement to B in order to induce B to enter into a contract with A. Okay, so the if B suffers some injury as a result of such misrepresentation, okay. Uh, in addition to A being liable to B in a tort of deceit, A will also be liable to be in contract. A contract between A and B in this case will become voidable. And B will have remedies as follows. The first one is to rest in the contract. So rescission is one of the remedies. And the other remedy is to claim damages for loss okay suffered by b as a result of such misrepresentation given by a okay so the uh, what happened it is it is shown I mean, the, in this diagram or this picture okay when a just gives a misstatement to b in order to the, induce b to enter into a contract with a if a does so with an intention to deceive b okay so in this case when B suffers some injury as a result of such statements given by A, that we such fraudulent, you know, the intention, okay, in this case, A commits a tort of deceit, and A will also be liable to B in contract. A contract between A and B will become voidable so that B can just rest in the contract and B can also claim damages for loss, okay, the... So if we get back to you know the trace type of misrepresentation, now we are discussing the first one. We can see that, okay. In fact, it is. I mean, the, even though this doctrine, it is the doctrine in contract law, but uh, you know the, the 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 in the context of fraudulent misrepresentation. Okay, in in fact, the rule which is going to apply it is the rule based upon tort. It is a tort of deceit, but this. Rule of tort of deceit is on sale, you know, to put into application in the context of making contracts as well. Okay, so the, in a way, it is the transportation of the rule of tort, okay, the, into a, uh, into, you know, the, into contract law. A contract between A and B will simply be voidable on the ground of a misrepresentation given by the misrepresenter. So that the misrepresentee can just, you know, raise in the contract and can just claim, claim remedies, okay, emerging from, you know, the, the misstatement given by the misrepresenter, okay. So, uh, we can see that, uh, if, if we look at case law, we will see that, you know, the case law has been develop, developed from the doctrine of 
fraudulent misrepresentation, okay? And after that, courts seem to develop, you know, the doctrine of misrepresentation to also cover, uh, you know, two more situations. The situation involving, you know, negligent misrepresentation and also situations involving innocent misrepresentation, okay? In the old days, okay, in the old days, the doctrine of, you know, the, in the old days, the doctrine of misrepresentation was limited in its, in its application, okay, only to what? Only to fraud cases. That means that, okay, that means that a misrepresenter would be liable to the misrepresentee for any falsity of his statement. Okay, only when he, when the misrepresenter did so, with the intention to deceive, okay, with some deceitful intention, okay, so that if the misrepresent, if the misrepresenter does, you know, admit a misrepresentation to a, another person without any intention to deceive, then you know the the misrepresenter would not be liable at all. Okay, so that this is this this is what the law. I mean, what the law was in the, the old day, okay, so not anymore now, okay, so that is in, old, in the old days, okay. So in, in the old days, a person would be liable for misrepresentation only when the misrepresentation in question was given to, with some fraudulent, you know, uh, in, intention, okay, if there is, if there was no you know the intention to deceive then the, a person to, who made such such uh, uh, false statements would not be liable okay we have you know the we have an example from the, this case so which seem to be you know the a leading case uh, in the in respect of the misrepresentation in english law okay jerry peak what happens in jerry peak is this okay the in the this uh, this case uh, was concerned with the facts which occurred in Plymouth, okay, in the UK, of course. Well, in Plymouth, there were also trams, okay, the tramways, right? So, so the, any company, a, any business entity uh, could just operate trams, okay, for the carriage of pass for the carriage of passengers, of course, and trams could be operated, okay, uh, by steam. Or also by you know the mechanical power. Okay, the, well, in the old days, the many tra many trams were operated by steam, of course, and and uh, uh, also by mechanical powers. Okay, by me uh, sorry, the trams could be could be operated by steam or mechanical powers. This is this is the first way. The second way is by animal power. You could use what? Uh, if you operated trams in the old days, you could use horses to draw trams. Okay. So in this case, one company, okay, one company, uh, wanted to operate trams. Okay, and uh, the law, the, the the law required the company to obtain, of course, permission from the board of trade. So the you know the company would have to obtain permission. Or approval from the board of trade in order to run you know the, the steam power trams okay and of course this business would require a large amount of money so that the companies wanted to issue what to issue shares okay in order to just you know the, uh, get some money for the investment in this business the thing is that when the company issued Shares, they would have to, you know, they would have to issue what? They would have to issue a prospectus, okay. So, of course, the prospect, the prospectus would have to make indication of important facts in order for investors, you know, to just digest information and make decision as to whether to buy shares from this company, okay. So the thing is that at that time, the company had not yet obtained approval from the board of trade yet I mean for the purpose of the operation of you know the uh, you know the trams 
to be operated by what to to be operated by steam or mechanical mechanical power. Okay, but the thing is that even though at that time the company had not yet obtained permission or approval from the board of trade, the company did you know make the statements in the prospectus that they had obtained permission okay or approval from the board of trade. I mean, for the for the operation of you know the, the steam, uh, you know steam the trams, steam operated trams. Okay, uh, so you know the, many investors believe in what was stated in the prospectus and they bought shares from this company. And let's say you know what happened. What happened was that the board of trade, you know, rejected, you know, rejected the application for. The, the the company the the, the company the, the the company application pro, for approval okay so that you know the the company the, did not obtain permission or approval from the board of trade for the operation of you know the this these trams uh, using you know steam or mechan mechanic power uh, so when the investor to knew the truth the the investor who had already purchased shares just claim that they would not be bound by you know the contract anymore okay of course you know when when investor bought shares from the company uh, between investor between shareholders and the company okay they had a contract right it is it may be called what it may be called the shareholders agreement or whatever okay in a way I mean that there was a contract between the company i.e. Plymouth Trump uh, Travis and you know shareholders the shareholders who had purchased shares from this company wanted to claim that the contract in question, okay, the shareholding agreement between them became voidable. I mean, all the contract I mean, the, became invalid because of, you know, because of a misstatement. Because of the, the misstatement, you know, the given by whom? Given by the company, okay, of Plymouth Tramways Company. Okay, in this case, the court held that no, okay. The the interest suffered by what? The interest of the interest suffered by the shareholder could not be remedied. Could not be remedied because of what? Because when Plymouth Tramways Company made you know the statement, made the misrepresentation to shareholders, they the company did not have any intention to deceive, you know, shareholders. Yeah. Of course, true that. I mean, at the time when the you know, at the time when the shareholder just purchased shares from the company, the shareholders rely on statement given by the company, okay, and uh, the company had made you know a false statement in the prospectus saying that they had obtained permission or approval for the board of trade for the for the operation of this uh, trams business, but even though the statements the statements the statements were false. The company did not have any intention to deceive shareholders. They, the company, they just, you know, they, they just honestly believe that the board of trade would certainly, you know, the, the grant permission, okay, because as a matter of practice, the board of trade would normally just grant permission, okay. It, is, it was a matter of what? A matter of formality. Anyone who submitted, you know, submitted the application for operation of tramways, okay, the with some I steam power, would normally be granted permission or approval by the company. Oh, sorry, by the board of trade, so that you know the company believed honestly that the board of trade would just grant permission. Right. The, the thing is that I meant it was quite unexpected that you know the board of trade finally did not grant permission, okay, so, but the thing is that when the company just made the, the indication in the prospectus, they, you know, they just honestly believe that they would get permission or, you know, the approval from the Board of Trade, so that they did not have any intention to deceive shareholders, so in this case, when there was no fraudulent intention, okay, the, on the part of the company, it was therefore here, by the court that okay the company would not be liable for I mean for any loss suffered by the shareholders so that the shareholders could not just you know the could not just escape contractual 
liability I mean the, under the agreement okay the shareholding agreement said that in this case shareholders could not claim that a contract I mean under which the shareholders bought shares was not given legal effect okay on the ground that you know that it was the contract the, the, the agreement was uh, made uh, as a result of a misrepresentation okay so the 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 judicial confirmation okay the, the uh, from this case is that a person A, let's say that we have A and B, okay, a person A, okay, will, a person A would be liable to B for the A's misrepresentation only when the misrepresentation was given with the intention to deceive or with, you know, with some fraudulent uh, intention, okay, if uh, if I mean the misrepresenter, okay, did not have any fraudulent uh, intention, okay, the the in the, the giving of the misstatement to the other party, then the misrepresenter would not be liable for any loss suffered by the misrepresentee. Okay, so this uh, became the rule of law. Okay, so the thing is that uh, we can just I mean the give, uh, we can just conclude that in the the old days. There was limitation of you know the, uh, the there was limit, limit, limitation okay surrounding the doctrine of misrepresentation. The doctrine of misrepresentation would be uh, put into operation only in the case of fraud. If anyone okay give any statements, uh, give any false statement to another person okay without any intention to deceive, i.e. without fraudulent. With a fraudulent uh, intent, then the misrepresenter would not be liable. Okay, so the, this seems to be loopholes. Okay, the, why so? Because there, there, there are also cases in which a person, okay, gives a misrepresentation, okay, or a person just makes a misrepresentation without any fraudulent intent. Okay, the, maybe a person just, you know, the gives a misstatement or make a misstatement by what? By negligence, uh, what we know as the negligent misrepresentation, okay? Or maybe a person does, you know, the, a person that might make a misrepresentation innocently without intention to deceive and without negligence, okay? So it could be the innocent misrepresentation, okay? So in this, these two cases, in these two cases, the misrepresentations, okay, are not fraudulent. They are just non-fraudulent. So that uh, the law did not, you know, say, okay, the law did not allow any any person to just claim, okay, to just claim li li liability against the misrepresenter, okay, because because there was no what there was no no fraud on the part of the misrepresenter okay so this seem to be loopholes these loopholes or this you know the this inadequacy uh, in the law would have to be would have to be remedied and uh, this loopholes later were remedied by two organs okay in charge of lawmaking uh, which organs okay that could just make law in the UK okay the first one of course is the judiciary okay the, the courts can just make law through their decision okay so that they can make just you know the judge made law right and in addition to the judiciary or the courts parliament can also make law parliament can just you know enact you know enact law Okay, so, so many pieces of legislation to, uh, are enacted indeed by Parliament. Okay, we can see that this loopholes, this loopholes were first, I mean, the filled by the courts. The court does try to expand, you know, the doctrine of misrepresentation. Okay, from the, from the, it's being limited to just fraud to, to what, to situations. Situations which were not concerned with fraud, but the situations which were concerned with negligence as well. 
So, okay, the court seemed to just, you know, seem, seem to do what? The court seemed to just ex expand the application of the doctrine of misrepresentation to cover the case of negligent misrepresentation as well. How have courts done this? How have courts developed, you know, the doctrine of misrepresentation to also cover the, the situations involving, you know, the negligence, misrepresentation as well. The court have, courts have done this way, okay. In fact, when we deal with negligence, misrepresentation, okay, we are dealing with the situation where the misrep misrepresenter does make the statements, make the false statements, okay, the, with negligence, okay, with negligence. So, in a way, when A makes a representation to B, when A makes a false, sorry, a misrepresentation to B, okay, A may be just careless. A may just do so, okay, without due care. So, when A does something in breach of due care, if A has a duty of K, okay, the, and A does not exercise, you know, the duty of K, A is just, A is just in breach of the duty of K. If the breach of the duty of K causes damage to anyone, okay, then the, the person who suffers injury, okay, the person who suffers damage, as, as a result of the breach of the duty of care, can just sue, okay, the person who owes the duty of care, okay. This is, in fact, liability, liability in tort, known as the tort of negligence, okay. So, this diagram tells you how a person will be liable in tort, in a tort of negligence. So, when A, okay, again, when A does something, does something without due care, okay, without due care, that means that without any reasonable basis, okay, with in, in relation to the act of giving a false statement, or in relation to the act of giving or making a misrepresentation, okay, when A, as the, mis as the misrepresenter, just makes a false statement to be okay the waste of due care that's mean that a has no reasonable basis for believing it to be true a does say something to be anyhow any anyhow without due care okay without any reasonable basis to believe it to be to be true okay so in this case if a does so a will commit a tort of negligence toward B. So that B may just do A for damages. Right. So in a way, the court, okay, the court just, the court doesn't, the just establishes the rule, the court just establish the rule that if somebody does gives, okay, that a false statement to another person, Without you, K, okay, i.e., without any reasonable ground, without any reasonable basis for believing it to be true. In this case, if you know the misrepresentee suffers some injury, then A, the misrepresenter, will have to be liable in tort or negligence. Right. So, in, in a way, okay, it is the case. It is a tort case, a tort, the tort of negligence. But the thing is that, again, the court seemed to just do what? The court seemed to just, you know, the, the import, uh, the court just seemed to just, you know, import this tort of neg negligence liability to the contractual context as well. Okay, we will see that later now. When the court established, you know, the, the tort of negligence in relation to a misstatement, the court courts, you know, the, have done this this way. Okay, the it it has been 
uh, it has been uh, done this way in the case known as Haley Ben and Haley. Haley Ben and Haley, okay, that seem to be the very, I mean, the one of early cases in which the court established the rule, okay, uh, to the effect of uh, expanding, you know, the doctrine of misrepresentation from uh, is being limited in application to just cases involving fraud to okay cover cases involving negligence. Okay, so the the court have done this this way. Okay, in this case, this in this case, the facts are you know summarized for you uh, this way. Okay, there was a company known as the uh, Haliband. Haliband uh, was a firm of advertising, the, you know, advertising the, the agents so that they could just receive orders, orders from clients, orders for, uh, you know, placing advertisement for clients. Okay, so that uh, one day, you know, the Haliband, Haliband, uh, of course, I mean the which was a firm of advertising agents, uh, Harley Ben received a very big, you know, the advertising the order from the from his client known as Easy Power Limited. So Harley Ben just received, you know, advertising orders from this client, okay, Easy Power Limited. Okay. So when Harley Ben wanted to enter into a contract with Easy Power. In relation to you know advertisement orders, Harley Bench would have to make sure that you know the client in this case is power was financially uh, stable. Okay, uh, Harley Bench wanted to ensure credit readiness of Easy Power, so that's why Harley Bench wanted to inquire you know the into Easy Power credit credit readiness. So Harley Bench does up his own bank to make inquiries, okay, to just address inquiries to Easy Powers Bank. Easy Powers Bank, in this case, was Haley and Partners. Right, so, you know, the Harley Ben addressed a request to his own bank. Okay, the Harley Ben just asked his own bank to ask Easy Power Bank about, you know, Easy Power credit readiness so that when you know the Harley Bend Bank received you know a request from Harley Bend, Easy Power Bank just redirected this request to Easy Power's Bank, the, you know the IED Harley and Partners. So Harley and Partners, upon receipt, upon receipt of the request, Harley and Partners just told you know the Harley Bend that wow. Easy Power was financially stable. Yeah. According to you know the indication made by Haley and uh, partners, Easy Power was of reliable, reliable credit worthiness. Okay, it was of good credit worthiness. In fact, Easy Power at that time you know the same to seem to have uh, trouble. With respect to financial matters, Easy Power, the Easy Power was not credit worthy. Indeed, the thing uh, it said so that we can see that you know the indication made by the statement made by whom the statement made by Haley and Partners. Okay, the statements made by Haley and, and Partners were false. Who would suffer injury? Okay, of course, Harley Ben. Because when Harley Ben entered into a contract with Easy Power, I mean the, of course, I mean the, under this contract, under the contract, Harley Ben does place, you know, advertisements for Easy Power. So if you know the some statements, if some advertisements as placed by Harley Ben on behalf of Easy Power, well, I mean the, where the, where the sort of, you know, the were bad and cause injury, okay, or cause loss to anyone, then Harley Ben would also be liable. You can imagine that, you know, the Harley Ben, uh, Harley Ben, Harley Ben does, okay, the place advertisements on behalf of East Power, okay, so the 
if you know if the uh, the statements if the advertisements placed by Taliban on behalf of East Power uh, cause some the loss to anyone, then Taliban would have to be liable as well. Okay, so what happened next is that East Power just went into liquidation. Okay, so that you know the the it could cause cause loss to many people. So that Taliban would be in trouble. You know, when the East Power went into liquidation, okay, so that's mean that, okay, in this case, when Haley Bent trusted the indication made by Haley Partners, Haley Bent just went ahead with, you know, making contracts with East Power. Right, so in this case, Haley Bent just suffers an injury as a result of the reliance on the statements made by Haley and partners. So the question which you know the which would have to be determined and answered by the court is whether or not okay the act of giving a false statement by Helen partners to Helen Bent would trigger any liability on the part of Helen and partners. Helen and partners here that was what was the misrepresenter. Would in this case the misrepresenter be liable to the misrepresentee for any loss suffered by the falsity of this in this statement given by the misrepresenter? Okay, remember in old days the misrepresenter would have to be liable for any misstatement only when the misrepresenter had the had the what had an intention to deceive or had some fraudulent intent. But in this case, Haley uh, and partners did not have any, had any intention to deceive. Okay, so that uh, if we just rely on the authority, okay, in, the, in this case, the repeat, remember what we just discussed in the, a few minutes ago, then if we rely on this authority, okay, then the consequence would be that Haley Bent, okay, sorry, the, the uh, Haley and partners would not be liable to uh, Haley Ben at all, right? But in this case, the court seem to seem to do what? The court seem to just expand the application, you know, of the doctrine of misrepresentation to cover the case of negligent misrepresentation as well. Okay, in this case, the court just held that well, okay, that a person who uh, made a negligent misrepresentation, okay, would have to be liable to the misrepresentee for the loss suffered by the misrepresentee, okay. This liability, it was the liability in what? In a tort of negligence, okay. So it is, it was not, in fact, any direct li 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 liability in contract, it was just liability in tort, tort of negligence, because the misrepresenter mis just committed a what? In this, in the way, I mean, if we are, if we are back to this case, Haley and partners, uh, Haley and partner was just negligent because Haley and partner just, you know, made the statement without the UK when Haley and partners, you know, did not exercise the UK, Haley and partners was in breach of the duty of care so when the breach of the duty of care caused causes damage then you know the person who does the person who uh, who the, who was in breach of the, the, duty, the duty of care would have to be liable for tort of negligence okay so in a way based upon the facts in this case you know the uh, then the Helian partners would have to be liable to Haley Bent, okay, in a tort or negligence. It is just a tort case. I mean, how can you know? How can we just place this case? I mean, the, how can we just you know, fit this case into contract law? Okay, the court at the time when the court decided this case, I mean, the, at the time when Haley Bent case was decided, of course, I mean the the, the linkage. The linkage of this tort of negligence 
to a contextual context was not quite clear, but okay, the later in a case known as Esopitolum and Murder. In this case, we can see, you know, the we can see quite clear transport, transportation of the tort of negligence rule into contract law. Okay, the so the transportation of the tort of negligence into the contract, okay, the uh, operate this way. In one part of the judicial speeches, okay, the law denning. The, the the at the time in the at the time he uh, at the time when he you know delivered the judgment okay he just delivered this speech if a man who has or professes to have special knowledge or skill makes a representation by which you there are the to another with the the intention of inducing him uh, him here means the other party, okay? To enter into a contract with him, then he, okay, that's mean the person who just made the statement, okay? He is under a duty to use reasonable care to see that the representation is correct and that the advice, information, or opinion is reliable. So, put simply, if I try to just convert, you know, this complicated judicial speech, into something something more plain, uh, you will get this one. What is said by Lord Denning, it is something like this. When A, let's say we have A and B, if A does through his negligence, okay, if he makes a misrepresentation to B, in order to induce B to enter into a contract with A, if A and B, okay, if A and B just intends uh, any conclusion of a contract, A uh, just makes a false statement to B in order to induce B to enter into a contract with A. In this case, A will have to make sure that he exercise the okay. If he does, you know, make the statement to induce B to enter into the contract with him, through negligence, if he does does so negatively, even though he has no intention to deceive B, but he does, he is just negligent. He does not exercise due care to make sure whether or not the statement given given by him to B is correct or not. In this case, if the statement given by him to B turns out to be false, okay the. Simply because he, the misrepresenter, simply because A as a misrepresenter is negligent, in that case, A, the misrepresenter, will have to be liable to B for the loss suffered by B. Okay, this is how the court tried to just transport, okay, the tort of negligence rule into a contract law. Into, the, into a contract, sorry, okay, so that, uh, you know, that now we can just see the application of a tort of negligence rule. We can see the application of a tort of negligence rule into the, con the, the you know, the contract context, okay. So that if we have A and B here, A, if A does make any misstatement, in this case, A is a rep representative. If A as a mistress, as a representative just makes a false statement to B, okay, and B as the as the rep, as the mistress representative suffers some injury, okay. In this case, if B suffer suffer the injury okay, as a result of the false statement given by A, uh, when A just gives statement to B in order to induce B, okay to enter into the contract with A, in this case, A will also be liable to B, okay, the, in this case, okay, it is also liability in contract. The remedies available to B are first that B can just set aside the contract. 
B can just avoid the contract, okay? And on sale, B can just claim damages for loss suffered by B as a result of the misrepresentation given by A. Okay, so this is the way in which the court seem to just trust, seem to just transport, you know, the rule in uh, the rule regarding a tort of negligence to a contractual context. Okay, my God, now I mean the it seem to uh, it seem that I have the you know the, the, deliver my lecture for an hour already. Okay, now that we are going to move forward to the third point of misrepresentation. Okay, the third point is what. The third point is the innocent misrepresentation. Okay, uh, let me uh, just check to what is on the screen now to make sure that everything is all right. Okay, I uh, want to make sure that you know no technical errors occurs in the course of my teaching here. Uh, so far, so good. Okay, now the the uh, video, the video that now seems to be fine. Okay, that I now record my teaching. Okay, so according to the screen. Everything seems to operate very, very well. Okay, so there uh, no problem in terms of technicality. Now, I'm going to get back to, you know, the, the lecture, okay? Uh, remember, we uh, have seen that there are three types of misrepresentation. The first one, it is fraudulent misrepresentation. The second one is negligent misrepresentation, remember? Remember, in old days, in the old days, Misrepresentation was limited in in its application to the case, cases involving fraud only. Okay, and we have seen already that you know the later courts try to expand, uh, you know, the doctrine of misrepresentation, misrepresentation to cover on say cases involving you know the misrepresentations uh, the, uh, given by given through negligence as well. Okay, the courts. Just try to import or transport, transport the rule, the rule regarding a tort of negligence through to what to a uh, to a contract as well. Okay, they say that if A give a statement to B in order to induce B to enter into a contract uh, with A, even though A has no intention to deceive B, even though A has no you know the fraudulent the intent. If A, you know, give the misstatement to B, the neg negligently, or through his negligence, then he, A, okay, as the midrep center will also be liable to B, okay, the, it is liability in the tort of negligence. Uh, uh, in addition to, you know, li liability in a tort of negligence, in this case, okay, this liability can also be regarded as liability in contract as well. Okay, because B can just claim that the contract between A and B is voidable, and B can just set aside the contract and also claim damages. Okay, that is what we have seen. Now we are moving forward to the third type of the misrepresentation. Okay, which is of course the innocent misrepresentation. Okay, this is what this is the act of making a statement, the act of making a misstatement known. Not with fraud, okay, not by fraud and not through negligence. So the misrepresent the misrepresenter is neither fraudulent okay, nor negligent. Okay, the misrepresenter okay the just give the misstatement to B without any intention to deceive B, no fraud. And without negligence without any breach of the duty of care, okay? Uh, but the thing is that A, as the misrepresenter, just makes a misstatement, okay, the innocently or honestly, believing that it is true, believing that the statement is correct, but it turns out to be incorrect or false. Okay, so the, you, again, Minda, you may you may just get the feeling that, well, you know, when A makes the statement to B, okay, without any fraudulent intent and without in any negligence, how can A be liable to B, as we have seen, okay? As I have earlier explained to you, in this case, the law will also have to have some concerns for B as well, 
The thing is that B, you know, when A just gives B, you know, that when A gives B a misstatement, even though, you know, that A believes it to be true, but it turns out to be false, even though A has no fraudulent intent and A is not negligent, but when B relies on this misstatement given by A, okay, the law will have to protect B as well in this case. Okay, B should B choose what? B should be given an opportunity to do what? To just rest in the contract and claim damages as well. But the thing is that, okay, the expansion of the doctrine of misrepresentation to the case to cases involving innocent misrepresentations, these attempts were not made by courts, but these attempts were made by Parliament. Parliament just enacted the law known as the Misrepresentation Act, 1967. Okay, and uh, in this act, according to the passion to this act, if A does give a misstatement to B innocently, okay, in this case, a contract between A and B may be set aside by B, uh, B as the misrepresentee, okay, so that remedies available, available to for the misrepresentees are as follows. First, rescission, okay. B, the, mis the misrepresentee can just, Okay, they can just rescind the contract. Okay, this is the way in which the parties are put back into the position as if the contract had never been made at all. Okay, and in addition to rescission, B, the misrepresentation, the okay, the if the court if even though B want to rescind the contract, but if the court if the court in the court's opinion. If in the court opinion, okay, the contract should not be allowed to be to come to an end, okay, the contract should be reserved. Yeah. If the court deem that, okay, it is more appropriate to hold the contract or to preserve the contract, the court will just, okay, the court will just allow, you know, the, the court will just allow the party who suffered injury. I mean, i.e. the misrepresentee, okay, to claim only damages in place of precision, in a way, you know, that uh, if the court, if the court deem it equitable to do so, the court may just preserve the contract and just allow the party, uh, you know, allow the misrepresentee to just claim damages in place of precision. Okay, but this remedy, it is not to be granted as of right, you know, of the misrepresentation, it is to be granted in the court's discretion, okay? Again, according to the Misrepresentation Act 1967, in Section 2, in Section 2.2, okay, to the, you know, Subsection 2 in this Act, okay, the, according to Section 2, Subsection 2, okay, the, if the court deem it equitable to do so, the court will just allow, you know, the misrepresentee to just claim damages in place of rescission. Okay, the contract is therefore, okay, uh, the the contract the contract therefore remains intact, provided that you know the person who suffered injury, i.e., the misrepresentee, can just claim damages rather than you know the, rather than just receipt rather than just uh, you know, the, the rather than just mean that having rescission of that contract. Okay, again, that is, you know, the court's uh, opinion, uh, the court description, okay, to be the, uh, to the, to make sure that, okay, the, the two parties, you know, the, the two parties will be presented with, you know, the, the, great, the greatest degree of the justice, right? Now, remember we have seen these three types of misrepresentations, okay, one, two, and three. Fraudulent misrepresentation, negligent misrepresentation, and innocent misrepresentation, okay. In these three types of misrepresentations, 
we shall just you know make sure that okay the, the statements which gives right to the statements which gives which gives right to litigation must be statements of fact when a you know when a does makes a false statement or when a gives b a misrepresentation okay the b can sue a or b can claim that a contract between a and b is voidable on the ground of a misrepresentation only when the misrepresentation misrepresentation in question it is okay the statement of fact that means that it must be a statement which cons confirms some facts. Okay, the, if the misrepresentation in question it is a statement of opinion, or even a statement of intention, okay, or even a statement of law, that does not provide any grounds for the misrepresentation to just claim that the contract will become voidable. Why so? Okay, if we look at a statement of opinion, the less important of when I just say something, okay, I may say, well, in my opinion, when I just say something to you like this, you as the misrepresentee should know that this is just it. This is just my opinion. This is just an opinion. It may be true. It may be untrue. So you should not just trust me. Okay, you should not trust that this is always true because it is just a matter of opinion, right? So you know when somebody does I mean, uh, when somebody just represent, represents some facts as a matter of opinion, that is just a statement of opinion, and that does not give give rise to any you know any any legal action. Okay, so in the case known as Bisset and uh, Wilkinson, okay. We can see a very good example. In this case, it was concerned with the sale, sale of land. This land was intended to do what? To be used for, for the, you know, for raising sheep. Okay, so you know when A, the vendor. A, the vendor, sold land to B. Okay, B would have to make sure about, you know, the, about the land, uh, you know, the land's capability of, uh, bearing sheep. So A just told me that, well, in my opinion, in my opinion, this land can bear about two dozen sheep. So B, the buyer, when the buyer, okay, was told this statement by A, that the statement is saying that, well, the in, you know, the in A's opinion, the land could just bear a bad when two doesn't cheap. B, the buyer, should be aware that this was just a statement of opinion. It could be true, it could be incorrect. Okay, it could be correct or it could be incorrect. It could be true or it could be false. Okay. So in this case, you know, what happened what happened next was that when it turned out to be that this land did not bear, you know, two doesn't cheap. As indicated by you know the vendor, the vendor's uh, you know statement, the, the buyer wanted to claim that you know the contract of sale here became voidable on the ground of misrepresentation. Okay, so it was held by the court that no, the buyer in this case could not rest in the contract because you know the the misrep the misrepresentation in question it was just a statement of opinion not a statement of fact it was not a statement which confirmed of any particular facts it was just a statement of opinion so if we just you know come across this kind of a misstatement given as a matter of opinion okay so the, we cannot just trust it we cannot just place full confidence on it okay so that uh, this kind of a misrepresentation cannot just give rise to any remedy, okay? Now, right, uh, I think I, I try to just skip some slides, okay? One of the important things is this one, okay? If A makes a statement to, if A does make a misstatement to B, okay, let's say that, uh, if A makes, 
the A makes statement to be right. In this case, yeah. if A does does so in order to induce B to enter into a contract with A, right. B okay can claim that a contract this contract can be voidable on the ground of a misrepresentation only when B has been in a way induced by the statement given by A. So the element of inducement is required for action actionability of you know the of, for actionability sorry for actionability on the ground of misrepresentation okay if when A gives a misstatement to B if B is not in any way induced by the statement given by A then B cannot have any remedy. B cannot have any action against A. Right. We can see that, okay, B is not induced by the statement given by A at all. If B knows that the statement given by A is false, even though A tells something, you know, something false to B, but B knows from the beginning that no, this indication made by A is false, it's not true. If B knows this from the beginning, that means that if B enters into a contract with A, it is not, it is not, you know, as a result of the statement given by A. It is by, it is, you mean, it, it is what? It is caused by something else. B enters into a contract with A, not as a result of the misstatement given by A, but B may enter into contract with A because B believe that, well, it is still worse. Okay. We can see an example from this case. Edward and Small. What happened in this case is this. Of course, again, it was concerned with the sale. The sale of what? The sale of some mines. Okay. Uh, so then the vendor, the vendor just earned uh, some mines, and the vendor, vendor, the vendors here wanted to sell the mines. Okay, and he wanted, he wanted to, you know, he wanted to just uh, uh, sell this mine to potential buyers. So he just exaggerated. He just exaggerated, you know, the mines, you know, capacities. He he said that well, well, this this mines was be was buying. You know, because what? I mean, this mice could, you know, uh, this mice could just, uh, could just I mean, uh, make a lot of profits. So, uh, in this case, you know, the, with the, vend the vendor just made a false statement as to what? As to the mice capacity, capacity to make profits. In fact, okay, the, when the, the vendor just, uh, you know, the, told the, the potential buyer about this, the potential buyer did not even believe in the exaggeration okay, made by the vendor. B, the buyer, let's say that we, we do the word A and B. A, A is a seller, okay. The seller just, you know, the, the seller just ex exaggerated the, the mice capacities. I mean, the, this ex exaggeration, of course, constitutes the misrepresentation, okay. The misrepresentation regarding the mice capacity, okay, but the 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 buyer, B the buyer, when the buyers you know the was was told this you know that this the facts, the buyer did not even believe the buyer just appointed his own team you know team of experts to just carry out assessment, okay of the mice capacities and the ass assessment made by you know the the, the buyers uh, group of experts also review that this mice were uh, able to produce okay the, the profit of this and that we seem to you know we seem to be the uh, in essence okay identical identical to the statements made by the, the vendor so that you know the buyer just decided to enter into the contract with the vendor. So in this case, B entered into a contract with A. Okay, not because B was in any way induced by the statement given by A, 
but because B believe in the in the what in the result in the re, in the result of the assessment by B zone team of expert. So in this case, when B was not in any way induced to uh, enter in the, into the contract with A. B was not in any way induced by the misstatement given by A. So the contract in question, okay, the sale contract here between A and B could not be set aside. Okay, the contract remained intact. Okay, so it was here that the buyer in this case, you know, the buyer has relied on his own uh, expert team. Okay, rather than, you know, rather than just the misrepresentation representation the, given by the vendor so that in this case okay there was no ground for any action okay for on it there was no ground for action okay the of the misrepresentation okay even though there was the misrepresentation by a b could not just set aside his contract b could not claim any damages from a uh, the vendor of course so if we compare with Thai law we have seen the principle of law regarding what? Regarding fraud. Remember, type in Thai law. We have the doctrine or the principle of law regarding fraud. Okay, the, if you remember, okay, if you remember, we have section 159, paragraph 2, which provides that an act procured by fraud shall become the voidable only, sorry, under paragraph 1, or, uh, when it is to such an extent that Without the said fraud, such a what, a what? Sorry, such what would act would not have been made. Again, an act, uh, an act procured by fraud shall become the voidable under paragraph one when it is to such an extent that without the said fraud, such what would act would not have such what would act would not have been made. Just mean that well, there must be in a way some kind of inducement okay if uh, you know the other party is not induced by you know the fraud committed by you know by the first party then the other party uh, cannot just have any action okay the, in the you know the in the uh, on the ground of fraud at all okay even though there even though there, there has been fraud uh, if you know the other party is not induced at all then the other party cannot just claim uh, the other party cannot just invoke fraud, uh, you know, in order for a contract to be voidable, right? So we have seen this. I think that when the, if you can remember, okay, I have also given you this example when I uh, gave, uh, uh, gave you and uh, when I gave you explanation uh, of uh, section one five nine paragraph two. Remember the case where you know the A so a diamond ring to B. Uh, telling me that you know the that diamond uh, here was from South Africa, okay. But the thing is that B, he uh, t uh, he happened to be an ex expert in precious stones. So uh, B knew that this diamond uh, was not from South Africa, but it was from Myanmar. The thing is that okay, B still wanted to buy this ring. We can see that in this case, I mean, when B entered into contract with A, okay. It was not because of the fraud by A, okay. But the thing is that it the contract was made because B believed that, okay. It is it was still worth buying, okay. So that uh, if the case in this case like this, then B, okay, that could not just claim that the contract is voidable, okay. So the, because right in this case we can see that there is no inducement, okay. So that uh, according to section one. Final paragraph two of the civil and comes to court. Okay, the B, the buyer, the, the buyer cannot just claim that the contract is voidable on the ground of fraud. Okay, so so that there is no difference. Okay, on this point between Thai law and English law. Now, when we have seen I mean, the position of English law here in the, in relation to misrepresentations, now we are going to just. You know, have comparison between Thai law and English law. Okay, we are going to arrive at okay the, a comparative remark okay, on differences okay between English law and Thai law. Okay, we can see that from when my the lecture okay for about I mean, the 
1.5 ounce now. Okay, we can see that in the UK, okay, English law has the doctrine of misrepresentation. And this doctrine is of far broader application than what we see in Thai law because in Thailand, we only have the doctrine or the principle of fraud in the civil and commercial code, okay, but in England, right, in England, okay, the, 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 the doctrine, it is not the doctrine of fraud, but the doctrine of misrepresentation, which covers three types of misrepresentation, fraud, negligent, and innocent, okay, so that uh, we can see that, okay, the, 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 the doctrine of misrepresentation in English law is for, you know, uh, is uh, far broader than the position in Thai law. Right. Thai law does not cover, you know, the negligent misrepresentation and uh, innocent misrepresentation. Okay, so, so I, try, I would like to just leave uh, to you to think about it, okay, whether or not we should have in any way, you know, any room, okay, for uh, inserting into our civil and come to code, okay, any new provisions to the effect that, okay, the uh, misrepresent misrepresentations given by A to B will on say, you know, they make it to, to reject, okay, the avoidable if, uh, you know, the B is induced by that misrepresentation Reputations are given by sorry given by A. Okay, even though A does not have any intention to deceive B, but if A does give the statement to B through A negligence, or even when A is innocent, it is saying that A honestly believe it to be true, but it turns out to be false. In that case, should we have any rule in our civil and commercial code allowing B as the you know, the mistress of T to just, uh, you know, claim that A to C gap, you know, the between A and B is voidable, okay, does in the, as much the same way as the doctrine of misrepresentation in English law, okay, so I leave it to you to think about it, okay. I may ask you in our, you know, midterm examination the, whether or not you agree that English law, okay, English law of contract with respect to the doctrine of the misrepresentation is more effective, or oh, it is, you know, the, it is of uh, you know, the greater, uh, it, is, it is of far broader application than what you see in the principle of fraud contained in the civil and commercial code, okay? Can you discuss this if I ask you this question in the, uh, in the midterm examination, okay? So, Think about it now. Do not think about it in your exam time, okay? At your, at, at your exam time. So that's it for the first half of the lecture. Okay, we will discuss after the break, okay, two more doctrines in English law. The doctrine of the doctrine of jurors and the doctrine of undue influence. We will see again that you know these two doctrines in English contract law can be of help, okay, to the parties to any party who suffers an injury, okay, to why the, if, uh, you know, the, if the, we uh, apply Thai law, maybe the person who suffers injury may not have remedy. So that means that English law is more efficient than Thai law in terms of protecting, you know, the, the, protecting the aggrieved parties you know, the, uh, and, ma uh, and make, making sure that the intention of, you know, the other party Okay, the, the intention of the party to the contract is still free, okay, and, uh, and uh, it is free and genuine, okay, so let's just uh, have discussion, okay, after the break. So that's it for now, and see you again uh, in the field uh, minutes time. Good luck for the moment. See you then.